Hey everybody, my name is Daniel Cruz. I'm from Liquid Media Group. I am the CFO and co-founder of Liquid Media Group. I'm Tyler Bushnell, CEO of Polykid. Uh, we're based in Los Angeles. Hey, I'm Blake Morris, reviews editor for Shack News. This is Princess Tobeans. She is my my faithful assistant. And of course, we have Greg Berkelton Burke, video editor for ShackNews.com. And today we are talking about Polycade. So yeah, let's start off. What What is Polycade uh, exactly? So Polycade is a, a gaming platform that is making gaming accessible and inclusive again. And I should say approachable. Accessible means something different. Uh, approachable and inclusive again, right? So we're a gaming platform that is easy to pick up, uh, easy to engage with, uh, good for you know local groups, families, in person, right? Play a lot of local uh, multiplayer uh, type of gaming. We love um, generally short form style games. Sort of this 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 style of gaming that tends to appeal to a more broad range of user than what we con today consider a gamer. Uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about the. You have a few different designs, right? There's a few different models uh, of the Polycade. Uh, I see you've got one one large ground unit behind you, and then another uh, smaller wall unit as well back there. Yeah, uh, and that's and they, so these are a couple of our products that we've produced. Uh, our, our wall unit is kind of our core offering uh, that we've been we've, we've been iterating on for a few years now. Um, this four-player cabinet um, we are reintroducing in our Indiegogo campaigns launching on Tuesday. Yeah. So, so we only made like 10 of these back in uh, a couple of years ago. So now we're adding it to the product line permanently. Can you talk about like uh, what separates your arcade cabinet specifically from like arcade one-up? Your, yours is different in the sense that you have, well, not, you're wall mounted and you actually have a PC inside this machine, correct? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I mean, uh, the, the obvious difference with us is is design, right? So we take a, a sort of different approach to the design of an arcade machine from from the outside. Um, and so, so this is, you know, kind of one difference, but functionally, and this is where maybe, you know, people get lost occasionally. Um, functionally, we are very different from most other arcade machines. Um, you know, the common perception with an arcade machine is that it is a retro gaming device. Um, and while, you know, there's a lot of games that were built specifically for arcades and you can't really play them other you know, on a different format. Um, there's also a lot of modern games uh, that were kind of built in the image of arcade games. Um, and so there's quite a few titles that play fabulously on an arcade machine. Um, and so our machines run a gaming PC. You can run retro games, but you can also run the latest and greatest modern titles. So for example, you know, Mortal Kombat 11, Street Fighter 5, uh, these titles are available on Steam and you can play them on our machines. Yeah, that means your entire library that you have, like you don't need to buy any games or whatever you own on your PC, you can just log into your Steam account and play them on your Polycade with the arcade controls. Precisely, yep. Uh, and then one of the things that we're adding in here is is the uh, like a sorting ability so that we're going to say, hey, we see you've got all these Steam games. Here's the games that we recommend you play as arcade games. Nice. Now, I know a lot of, uh, for, 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 for a long while, it seemed like, you know, sort of homebrewing arcade cabinets was just like, not really an underground thing, but it was like very much like, a hobby for a lot of people it wasn't really a mainstream thing but over the last few years we've really seen like the home arcade experience become like extremely popular w w as a ma as a mainstream product like what do you what do you think is like the driving factor behind behind that so you know gaming is an interesting thing when you look at it in the, the full timeline arc um so you know where i feel like gaming started was at this like central kind of commitment level right it's like pretty easy to pick up one of the games pretty quick to figure out how to play it and what's going on right you only have a maximum of two to six buttons uh right most people can engage with that kind of gaming um and then as the as gaming and, and graphics improved uh controllers started to get more complicated um and and the gameplay itself became more complicated as well right and so you have what started as like this level of difficulty and commitment level sort of shifted forward to like this level of commitment. Totally agree. 
right? And so like, you've heard it a million times, like from your buddies and otherwise that say, gosh, I used to love video games, but you know, I just don't have time for them anymore. Right. And so yeah. they're like following that arc of video games that actually like continued to demand more time and more commitment from players. Right. And a lot of people are like, I don't, I can't do it. You know, I've got a family and a job and like, that's what I'm spending my time on. I can't play Call of Duty for four hours per night. Um, and so, so, and then meanwhile, you also have like, you know, where we started in this central area, things got a little more complicated. Things also went th this other direction with mobile games, right? So things got, uh, we have the, the concept of casual gaming and, and that ten and the mobile device is king for that, right? Um, but everybody sort of forgot about everything in the middle. Um, and this is what's generally known as mid-core gaming, uh, which is not talked about so much. Um, but you know, if, if that was a more well-known concept, I would say Polycade is the platform for mid-core gaming. Um, we, we play in casual um, and you can play hardcore games on our, our systems, but really where we spend our time in uh, curation and, and uh, licensing is, is with mid-core titles. Daniel, question for you. Um, obviously, let's pretend for a minute we don't have stay-at-home orders and like, you know, this COVID thing isn't real, but uh, have you guys reached out to like, um, I see obviously there's the private market for this for collectors and, and arcade enthusiasts that want something like this, but have you also considered uh, like hotel room lobbies, barcades, uh, schools, like stuff like that, places where people can buy them and put them in their place of business or in like a waiting room or something for people to play while they're waiting? Has, has that come up in conversations? Is that part of your marketing plans? Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're totally bang on. I mean, you know, I'm up here in Canada and I remember I went down to AlienCon uh, last year. Um, we, we have a mobile game, Ancient Aliens, that we're working with with uh, A&E. And when I started walking around LA, I noticed like it's a thing, right? There's like the old arcade bars. And of course you see Street Fighter 2 and you're like, oh my God, I got to play. So, um, you know, I think in the US, it's more prominent up here in Canada it's kind of just just catching on. And I think you're exactly right, Greg, like a rec room that has ping pong and foosball. I mean, that's kind of fun. But for me as a gamer growing up in the gaming business, that's that's what I want to play, right? I want to play these old games. And at the same time, Mortal Kombat 11 is super cool to have the best of both worlds. Awesome. I'm kind of curious. Um... The, I really like the design it's, uh, uh, of your cabs. It's almost like uh, a, a minimalist modern art design, you know. Uh, how much, uh, what was what was the process of like coming coming up with like what you wanted these caps to look like? Especially because like I've never seen uh, an arcade cab that just hangs off the wall like this before either. Awesome. Know? Well, yeah, totally. It was, a, it's kind of a funny story. So, um, I, you know, I've always wanted to make my own, uh, make my own arcade machine ever since I was like 18 and learned that that was a thing. Um, and so one day I told my wife like, Hey, I'm going to build an arcade machine and I want it to live in the living room. Um, and she's an interior designer. So she said, Oh, that's never going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, wait a minute. You know, we can solve this problem. Like you want it to look a certain way like and I, I brought up you know like 20 designs and I'm like here what about this what about this and she's like okay maybe something like that and like after a, a, some iteration uh we got to a spot where she said that can go in the living room nice nice how uh what, what's the process of like hanging one of these bad boys up uh Whoa. so it's just like mounting a tv um and uh, and so it's just a bracket on the wall, uh, four screws into studs, and then the machine hangs onto the, the bracket. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, and funny story about uh, the wall mounted factor that, uh, I, you know, I, I wish I would say that was super intentional, but it was kind of accidental. Our first machine uh, was freestanding, but it was the same thickness. And um, you, the, you know, we were saying, hey, you gotta like, screw this machine into the wall and attach it there. Um, but we were convinced like, okay, people are gonna like unbox it, get excited, start playing, not gonna attach it to the wall. And then they're gonna walk away, their kid's gonna walk up, pull on the joysticks and the whole thing's gonna like come down on them. Uh, so we were like, how do we make sure this never happens? Uh, let's cut the bottom off and say, you must hang it. <laughs> 
And then we tried that and we were like, wow, this is great. We're totally doing it like this. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Cause like, I love arcade cabs. I love like the whole, the whole homebrew scene uh, that has come uh, out in like the last couple of decades or so. Like I'm really into it, but I also live in a very tiny apartment. So I can't really have an arcade. It's like I can have a living room or I can have an arcade. And at this age, it's probably more adult to have the living room. <laughs> but I would still, <laughs> you know, I still love having like stuff like this around even then. So like I, yeah, I think just from like a, from a spatial consideration, like I appreciate like that, that minimalist design and also being able to like hang something on the wall and it's not taking up as much more space. Yeah. How much does like the wall room. unit weigh? Um, so they're about 160 pounds. Whoo! Oh boy! Yeah. Uh, now, That's stud mounted then. Stud mounted for sure. Yeah, stud mounted for sure. They're, I mean, they're they're made out of powder coated steel, so they're super strong, super nice. Um, they also have like a quality feel to them that most of our our clients that unbox the machine, they're like, wow, this is a lot nicer than I was expecting. Um, nice. We are also introducing in our Indiegogo campaign a new version of the wall mounted unit that's gonna be half the price. Um, and so that version will have a, a wooden cabinet, laminated wooden cabinet that you'll assemble yourself. Um, the control panel portion will be pre-assembled and actually the same exact um, component that comes in our, our uh, Lux machine. Um, and so so basically aiming to, you know, hey, we've been doing the, the fancy product for a while and we wanna, you know, have a version that's more um, affordable. Daniel, do you think um, there's a market for people to like uh, buy the poly K just the cabinet itself and not the computer that comes inside? Like actually just the design of it, like if they want it in wood or powder coated steel, like do you think there's, is that something that you may look into in the future for consumers? You know, I'll, I'll talk about me. You know, I think Tyler has a, you know, great strategy for the product, but you know, just me as a consumer, right? I got, I got PlayStation, you know, four. And, you know, I think to what kind of Tyler said before, it's like, I can't keep up to play Fortnite. I, I get killed in five minutes. So I want that casual experience. And, um, you know, I think as a kind of average gamer, you might not know the kind of technical aspects of, you know, preloading a game or downloading some of these games. So, you know, I think the all-in-one solution that, that Tyler has uh, as a strategy is great. Um, because I, I'm not the most technical guy. I, I'm like, you know, duck hunt with the gun and the two buttons and controller. So I think Tyler having the arcade joystick is uh, is great to keep it simple, um, but I'll let him talk about the technical side of it. Yeah, so so like Daniel said, you know, we're, we're uh, a big focus for us is is making gaming approachable. And so plug and play is, is super important. Um, that being said, we are moving towards a direction that would enable um, home makers to uh, makers at home uh, to uh, create their own cabinets and systems. So while we're not offering um, the cabinet, you know, a blank cabinet at this time, uh, you can download our software uh, and install that on your arcade machine. We're, we'll even help you help guide you as to what components to buy. Um, and down the road, we'll probably be offering component packs and kits and, uh, you know, if you want to make your own cabinet, here's the plans. Uh, we do have that in our plans. Um, for now, it's just the software. Nice. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm guessing you guys grew up in the arcade era, uh, you know, when you could go into any mall in the U.S., when malls were still a thing, too. <laughs> and uh you know and plunk down way too much money to like uh to, to beat games i was just curious like what were what were some of the games and like cabs that influenced uh you guys when you were when you were putting the project together so one of my you know original drivers for building a machine um actually there's two um i grew up with a um Donkey Kong Jr. arcade machine in the house, um, and also a Super Break, uh, Super Breakout arcade machine. Uh, we also had Pango, and that's like the family favorite, but for some reason I never got too deep into that one. Um, 
But oh. Super Breakout and Donkey Kong Jr. are like, oh, those are my arcade games. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I think, you know, Statue of Limitations is uh, long past, but we, we had a arcade in uh, the place up here in Canada, in Vancouver. It's called Kids Only. And uh, I remember one point they're putting tokens in the newspaper and they're handing it out to all the apartment buildings. And when I ran out of quarters, we would run around, grab the newspaper with like the, you know, paper cut out of four tokens, trade it in for four quarters. And I was at the arcade all day. Um, you know, Street Fighter obviously was, was one of the games, but like the X-Men uh, game and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, when you could get like four of your buddies together, yes. uh, that was huge for me. And, um, you know, I, I think Tyler, that's what brought me to the opportunity. Like. It literally has never left my, you know, my heart, my soul, right? Just that arcade experience. Yeah, yes. definitely. I love those stories of like, uh, just, you know, figuring out where you can get quarters for the arcade machine. We we used to go uh, rollerblading when rollerblading was cool. I guess that's happening again now. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> down by Stanford <laughs> campus. And Stanford had an arcade. It was actually the closest one to home. Uh, they also had Hoover Tower, which uh, has a bell inside and people throw quarters at the bell to make it ring and there's a big cage around it. Uh, so we used to go up to Hoover Tower with coat hangers and like scrape the quarters from under the cage and I guess steal wishes. Maybe that's what that we were a little like uncertain whether that's OK. You're stealing people's wishes. You can't steal wishes. Oh, my but goodness. If you turn <laughs> wishes into pizza in arcade games. Doesn't that kind of make them bigger wishes? That's kind of magical, I think. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's it's real wish. It's it's yeah. It's kind of making a wish a reality there. Like you, you wish for pizza <laughs> yeah. in video games. You get right? it. <laughs> yeah. Now uh, no orders anymore. We just gotta <laughs> yeah. keep pressing yeah. the button, charge it. Yeah. Tyler, now, uh, you, you have a Tyler. You have a really interesting family history. Um, with your dad and kind of almost it's I want to say it's a legacy at this point I mean your dad saw something in a product and an idea that not a lot of people were given a lot of credit to like I guess my question is like how does that factor into like your business and your concepts and like how is it growing up with a dad who you know basically revolutionized Atari totally yeah it's, it's always been a journey and um, knowing nothing else I maybe can't compare it very well um, but, uh, you know, gaming has always been a central part of our family, just baked in, you know, I mean, beyond dad's, like, uh, achievements in the gaming space, um, you know, board games are huge in the family, and so we've, we've always been, uh, big, big players of games, um, and so, so that's been super fun, and then just, you know, also, dad being like a very entrepreneurial uh, individual kind of set us all on our own entrepreneurial paths um, and so that's that's been that's been fun as well um, I really enjoyed especially in my teenage years as I was really starting to think about creating businesses um, bouncing ideas off of him and, and just kind of getting that mentorship growing up I think was super valuable awesome um, now, Daniel, you mentioned like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, you have the the stand up arcade cabinet with with four controllers there. Was Ninja Turtles the main like factor consideration for putting in like the four player uh, setup? <laughs> so, I, I the the classic arcade folks might lynch me for this, um, but. The four player setup, we were super extra excited to play um, because of a handful of like modern games like Speedrunners, Towerfall, um, Lethal League. All these games are so awesome at four players. These great like, you know, brawler versus games. Um, Turtles has got a special place in my heart, but personally, I have a tough time playing that game today. Huh. So I that, played that's, it in 20 years. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, maybe I'm not allowed to say that. I don't know. No, it's all right. You can say, yeah. You can. Turtles with a half shell, right? <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting because, like, you know, I'm old. But the first place my brain goes is like, oh, I'm going to play The Simpsons and Ninja Ooh. Turtles and X-Men, you know, all those totally. classic four-player brawlers. Like, that's the first thing 
in my head, but like in reality, probably more people are playing the more modern games now. Like even like Towerfall. I love Towerfall. Towerfall is freaking awesome. It's like so one good. of the best like four player competitive games out there. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it's super great. Yeah, to have that, to have that experience of everyone standing around like an arcade cabin playing that, like I, you know, I could definitely see the the awesomeness of that. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I, I do love Gauntlet. That's a game that I Ooh. I can spend some time on. Uh, Ninja Turtles is fun for me for like one level. I feel that those hack and slashers, hack and slashers do get repetitive pretty quickly, but. Yeah. But there's, but you know, I, uh, but you know, there's something, there's definitely something to be said for the nostalgia factor. I'm sure you can appreciate that as well, though, right? One hundred percent. Even just seeing like the moves, like how Bart Simpson like attacks with his skateboard and stuff, is uh, it triggers some memories. <laughs> nice. Daniel, as uh, as CFO, what are your thoughts on platforms like Indiegogo, Kickstarter, stuff like that? What does that open for your business? in a positive light, because that's something you couldn't do 30 years ago. You had to go to an investor and say, look, I got this idea, I need $3 million. You know what I mean? And then you had, you know, all that stuff. Like, how does that help? How is that, how have those tools helped you grow a company in today in 2020 or help you let people know Polycade exists or just bring this uh, project to a reality, really? Yeah, I mean, you know, great question. Like, you know, our company, we're a publicly traded company on, on, on NASDAQ, right? And, you know, growing up here in Vancouver, kind of Hollywood North, you know, you saw, you know, all the movies being filmed, but there's also a huge gaming uh, scene up here. So, you know, I've been following the market and, you know, we want to produce content for the streaming age. And I think, you know, the Netflix of gaming is is really gathering speed. You know, you're seeing Microsoft now do this huge acquisition that for me on the finance side is, is telling you there's a, there's a big trend coming here. And, you know, the tech companies are getting into gaming. So, you know, I've been following the trends um, of late, obviously, um, for our company. And, you know, the PC market is is a good market and the mobile market is larger at the moment. But I think what the coolest thing about Polycade and what Tyler's doing is he's bringing it all together. So, you know, you have this one platform that you can, you know, put your library on and access it. And for a business owner, entrepreneur in, in a small you know company, you know, that's, a, that's an all-in-one solution that can really help uh, drive sales. And, you know, the retro gaming market wasn't that established, right? Like, I talked about Duck Hunt and Nintendo, but I think it was only a couple years ago that you couldn't even get one of the old school Nintendos, right? Best Buy and everything had it sold out. So, you know, when I got connected here with, with Tyler and Polycade, it was just like, man, where have you been my whole life? <laughs> Well, yeah, and Daniel Daniel mentions, you know, like the the uh, kind of some of the retro products we've seen of late, you know, retro's kind of a popular category right now. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of what we see uh, coming out, it's, it's sort of these like embedded devices that are non-expandable. Um, the, the way that retro is frequently released is not really like a future proof or um, it's not like you're it's it's not the way that you might um, want to distribute those games um, and so so we feel like you know let's get a platform where you can kind of revisit these games whenever you want you don't need special hardware that you have to pull out of the closet and plug in to decide that you're gonna have this retro gaming experience it's just baked into your game platform okay, where can people go to support your polycade like what when does your indiegogo, indiegogo go live how much you asking where can they go to support it i'll also leave a link in the description below so they can click on it as well yeah awesome yeah so so we're launching our indiegogo campaign on tuesday that's october 27th um you can there will be it'll be linked on our website um but you can also follow us on instagram uh we're gonna mention it there um, and so definitely follow along we've, on our website. We've got some uh, sign up forms where you can keep informed. Uh, we'll let you know when the campaign launches and all that good stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, the nice thing too is the software is going to be released to our backers um, right at the end of the campaign. Uh, at that point, you'll be able to uh, pick up like a lot of the liquid media games like Bubble Bobble. Um, I mean, God, I feel like. I literally can remember so clearly staying up all night with my friend Paul playing Bubble Bobble. Uh, 
I think we beat it, but we might have gotten to the last level and we not beat the boss. Oh, dude, yeah. that game. Yeah, I have, I've, I've had some bubble bobble nights with my <laughs> homies as well. I, I feel you <laughs> on that one. Yeah, that's, right? yeah, like that particular game too, because like, man, it's, yeah, you get through all those levels, you're feeling good, and then one thing goes wrong and it's back to the beginning, which is yeah. also something that modern gamers just don't appreciate, like busting your butt, getting so far, and then having to like start from the actual beginning. Again, <laughs> no save states, none of that stuff. Back in my day, we had to we had to walk uphill both ways, playing <laughs> bubble bobble, and we still couldn't beat it. Um, no doubt. Yeah. All right. I think Princess Tobin's had a question. She wanted to know if you thought about putting a cat bed up top or like a scratching post or anything. Ooh, that's possible. I mean, we've got a little room right down here in the front of the cab. Ooh. Yeah, that might work. That might work. Yeah. A little um, accessories. Yeah. That approved. Cause yeah, because otherwise she's just going to jump up and like try and grab a controller and, and join in. And yeah, that, well, that hey, you know, with our, our um, Lux machine, it's, it takes magnetic features. So we're going to have magnetic cup holders soon. Uh, in fact, sometimes the graphics can be magnetic. Um, <laughs> and so maybe we'll have to do a magnetic uh, cap bed. That was that a Chris Angel cool. moment right there. You just pulled it off. You're like, this is even paint. <laughs> you just pulled it right, right? off. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it could have been my. Never mind. That was uh, your that was your mind freak moment of the interview. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, awesome. Well, this is really cool. You know, as a as a fan of both modern gaming and classic gaming, like stuff like this, like is has a big appeal to me because you know I I grew up like uh, I think a lot of kids just dreamed of having their own arcade one one day when they were an adult. You know, um, most people grew out of it. I didn't. Um, and like, uh, yeah, now it's like kind of like stuff like this mm, puts it within an affordable range for me to actually, to actually be able to afford to like live that dream now. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and, um, not shown here is a little like arcade controller that will have you play on your lap on the couch as well. Oh, awesome. Sweet. So it sounds like you guys have like a awesome little suite of products coming up here for us. Then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, what we're most excited about is the upcoming console. Um, you know, Bubble Bobble plays great as an arcade machine, but it also plays great on, on classic uh, style controllers. So um, alongside the console, we've got a Super Nintendo style retro controller, Bluetooth, high quality. Um, and that is uh, super, we're, we're real excited about that one. So Daniel, can you talk about like how this partnership came about with you and Polly Cade and talk about your company overall. What is well, your what does your company like exactly do? You, got, the, you, mentioned, you mentioned you're yeah. publicly shared as well. Yeah, no, thanks. So um, you know, we're we're publicly traded. Uh, we came out of Vancouver, right? So we call it Hollywood North, even though Hollywood North is you know all of Canada. So uh, the ticker symbol for uh, the airport in um, Vancouver is YVR. So you know, we chose that as you know a, a representation to the city and, and the country. And you know how the partnership came about is uh, we're a studio for all platforms. You know we believe that you know content can go across multiple verticals. So you know I talked about TNG Ninja Turtles, right? It's a TV show, comic, you know, game. Um, so that's our philosophy. We want to empower content creators and entrepreneurs. And we purchased these retro games a couple of years ago. And, you know, as you know, it's, it's a hard thing to monetize and, um, you know, Steam and some of these other platforms have, have been a great place to um, go to. But when, when I saw Tyler's platform and, you know, his customer service and knowledge of the sector, and of course, you know, the legendary family, I, I just, you know, we knew we had to get in business together. So um, we're so excited to uh, have his background to bring our games back to life. Um, you know, I think the overall trend of the business is, is booming. So, you know, we couldn't be happier that Tyler uh, got some of our retro games and he has an all-in-one solution. Yeah, and, and, and just to tack on to that, you know, like the um, Liquid's got some, some great IP that, that like, you know, could be potentially expensive to get into the market. Um, and so, you know, one of our goals is to make that uh, as easy as possible for, for um, for Liquid Media as well. Um, and so, you know, we really like 
we love the history of video games and you know we're like at this point with video games now where um you know there's museums and people need to still access this like nostalgic content because it's part of our culture um and so and it's it's to me it's like kind of heartbreaking and a shame when um you know some of these old games like don't see or have difficulty seeing the light of day because of technological limitations um that that you know where we can totally work around at this point I think that's another issue that Daniel brings up is that uh, a lot of these games that have an intellectual property, like it's some of these, like people don't even know who owns what anymore. I remember talking to another developer where like the theme song for a very particular game, they couldn't find who the hell owned it. So they couldn't put it in the game, even though they technically owned the original IP, but the, uh, the theme song was still being different. Like it's the world of licensing is very fickle and interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, like, you know, talking about, you know, duck hunt and stuff. I think when when we first started playing these games as kids, you never really kind of envisioned, right? Like 30 years from now, we're going to have Wi-Fi and, you know, we're going to be able to play these games at home. And, you know, you're going to be able to bring up these consoles and you're going to be able to stream the games direct to your house. Um, So, you know, I I think it's just mind boggling that um, the long tail of these products just continues, right? We're still talking about this. And there's a financial, you know, upside obviously to this business. So um, we're super excited, and, and Tyler's made it so easy for us to, you know, bring these games back to life, like he said. And you know, we can't wait to build on the relationship and expand uh, our strategic partnership. Nice. Uh, so what's like, what's your roadmap for uh, 2021? Uh, like when we're eventually allowed to go outside again yeah. and like you know actually talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Geez. Yeah. Well. Solar panel? Solar, do I tell them solar panel? Probably kidding, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Polycade's making an antivirus suit <laughs> that you can play arcade games on. You're right. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, my, my outlook is, um, you know, the sector from a financial standpoint is, is larger than the film business. You know, it's obviously in a very hard position, so I don't want to pick on it, but, um, you know, gaming's converging, right? You know, Xbox is is connecting the PC Game Pass, you know, with the console. You know, I was talking about being a PlayStation guy and, you know, I, I guess I could go to GameStop, but not really. So the <laughs> accessibility of being able to download content in the new streaming age and Polycade being that all-in-one system for us to do the new games and the old games. I mean, it's it's a very bright future in my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and with the, the kind of, um, you know, pandemic life going away and us returning to some level of like normal um, out and about social interactions, uh, you know, we've, we've been excited to be working with Li- Liquid because of their uh, sort of like, you know, broad reach in Canada um, and, and what they could do for us uh, on the distribution side and, and actually getting these machines into public spaces where you know, anyone can play them uh, very easily. Nice. Yeah, and at least for right now, you know, we can't really go to an arcade, but we can we can get a polycade and just have that experience at home for for now. I yeah, but I think hopefully going into twenty twenty one, we'll all be able to expand our horizons. Uh, whether that means just being able to get out of the house or getting some some poly kids into some businesses right yeah totally well and, and some fun features that we have is that um your lot your user account transfers from you know your home setup to the bar that you play at and all of that so so mm-hmm. when you log in any configurations that you've set up at home show up on the machine at the bar uh games that you own you can play on the machine at the bar um and so it's kind of this connected experience um that, that transfers between devices. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's a really cool feature. I like that a lot. Yeah, super yeah, fun. That's, yeah, because I can just uh, just walk into a bar, bust out Miss Pac-Man, get the high score, rub it in everybody's faces. Feel like and then you'll be the mayor of that bar. Yes. The mayor. <laughs> <laughs> 